Want to patent your invention? The chance is near. You've given it heart. Now get it in gear. It's Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. Well, hello, everybody. One well, my, hello, everybody. Yes. <laughs> one of my favorite people is here. None other than, ta-da, the inventress, Lisa Askelis. Yes, Welcome. The renowned Lisa Askelis, <laughs> famous for helping inventors go from idea to QVC, Home Shopping Network, and really just taking them above and beyond in so many ways. Welcome, Lisa. So great to have you here. So great to always be here. And you guys are my favorite people, too, I have to tell you. We'll love, accept love, that. Love. We'll yes. accept yeah. that. Good. And thank you for that great introduction. I love it. So today you're going to be here talking to us about manufacturing. That's an area of expertise that you have where really a lot of inventors who have products, they need this information because actually having something made in the U.S. or overseas is really a pretty big task. So we're bringing you on today to go into a lot of detail about how inventors can have their stuff made. So what is the first step? Well, the first step is really understanding your source, who your source is, who the manufacturer is. You know, I hear a lot of people going on different sites and searching for manufacturers, but I have to tell you, I usually deal with people I know, friends of friends or the people I've dealt with for many years, my engineers. I trust my engineers and people who understand who these manufacturers are. So the trust factor is really, really important, especially if you're dealing with somebody overseas. Absolutely. Yeah, so everybody probably knows this. I buy a lot of shoes. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I know that for sure. (laughs) But the ones that are made in the USA are like two or three times more than the others. Mm -hmm. So where do you have most of your clients' products manufactured? I have to tell you, I've made a little bit of a shift. I've manufactured in China for many, many years. And um, I'm still doing China. I'm doing a lot of India these days. I'm doing a lot of India where they're very careful with their tariffs. And that's another topic. That's a whole nother discussion. But I do do a lot in India. I do some in Mexico. And um, again, as I said, in China as well. And, And some here in the United States, depending upon what it is. Paper, I do here. But I mean, the whole deal is you really have to be able to trust the manufacturer you're dealing with. You have to know who they are, understand that they're not just a manufacturing company that has set up in their basement and is telling you that they can manufacture 100,000 units when they have one sewing machine. So do you travel overseas to visit these manufacturers? Do you recommend that your clients do that? Sometimes. I try to avoid it because a 16-hour flight is a little bit <laughs> is a, is a bit much. So you make a friend in India who yes. goes and checks it out for you. I do. And we, I mean, there's so many different apps to contact and communicate with my manufacturers. WeChat is one of the ones I use and... So I communicate with my manufacturers literally all night long. Hence the bags (laughs) under my eyes. Okay. So so you. So quality is always a concern. Mm -hmm. So. Do you get samples? Do you go, are you the one that goes back and forth with the representative in India over, like, let's say something comes out and it's a fabric thing and it's too thin? I do. So, and and they have to understand, language barriers are giant when it comes to manufacturing and you're very lucky when you can get someone who really gets it. I mean, so I send videos, I feel the fabric and show them what it is and explain the texture, even the types of plastic I use. PP and different, you know, different levels of plastic and cardboard and everything else. So you have to describe it and be as clear and concise as you could possibly be. The video is giant. So I do videos, I show them, I talk about it, I hold it up and we have a conversation about it. And then I send samples. So the best thing to do is send the manufacturer a sample of what it is that you want. And there are specifications to everything. Manufacturing can be relatively simple. Mm. Okay, so if you're sending them specific samples of a fabric and it's neoprene and it's 1.5 in weight neoprene, send them that with all of the documentation so you're not going back and forth with five or six uh, prototypes because it costs you money. Every time you change something. Every time you change. So how does a, somebody who's just starting up get a manufacturer even interested in making their stuff, right? Because lots of these companies, they want the big runs. They want to be working with people who are going to sell in Target and Walmart and all those things. Sometimes getting a manufacturer to make a small quantity is kind of difficult, right? I love that question, Richard, because the manufacturer can turn you down in a heartbeat. 
They're not interested in manufacturing with you unless you are there for the long haul. You know, because it costs them a lot of money to pull up, you know, open up, turn on their machines and their, you know, bring people in and everything else to make you prototypes and do They're kind of doing things almost for free because they want your work. So look buttoned up. If you watch Shark Tank, when you see those people going on Shark Tank, they look like they're done. Some haven't even started their businesses, but they have T-shirts. They've got a website. They've got price points. They've got documentation they have images so going into a manufacturer have your stuff together have a logo have a one page website have something that they could look at so that they know you're serious about what you're doing if yeah. they don't think you're serious they're not playing games with you and they're not they're going to say you know what we're not interested in your product and i can't emphasize enough how important intellectual property is mm-hmm. in that process if you're working in china it's inexpensive to file a patent in china And even though China is not the best country for Mm -hmm. intellectual property enforcement, having a patent there gives you an extra layer of protection. Agreed. And and you need to have a good, solid agreement. But none of that beats having somebody that you trust. 100%. And that's why I sent everybody to you guys. (laughs) Yeah. And we sent everybody to you guys first. You have a QVC episode coming up, don't you, with uh, Kevin Lang? So tell us about that. That's so exciting. Yes, we're so excited. And it all started here with you guys and Kenya. (laughs) And it's so magical that this has happened. So, um, yes, so Kevin Lane, who started out here with Kenya on a beach in Atlantic City, and that's a whole other story. So the way I understand the story, Kevin was out there building sandcastles. For our listeners who don't remember Kevin, he has a product where he's making sandcastles on the beach, and he has these fantastic molds and lights, and he creates these beautiful creations, right? And then Kenya was out for a walk, and she wandered over there and started talking to him. And then all of a sudden, he was on the show because Kenya <laughs> thought it was so fantastic. Yeah. And then he, we introduced him to you, and now he's on QVC. That was crazy. And and I wish Kenya was at the conference because he, he always talks about that, and it, the beach was empty, and not a lot of people were there, and Kenya walks by with her family and so forth. And and then, you know, she says, you have to meet these Folks, the Gearhearts on, you know, they're, you have to get on their show. Gets on their show, we meet, and um, he comes to our conference, our AOE conference last year, last August. He was, um, I always have a two minute elevator pitch for product pitch. He won the product pitch. I then pitched his product with him to QVC. Uh, that was November. So in less than a year, he's launching his product on QVC television. So networking, connecting, talking all the time. Keep your tongue moving. You never know who you're going to meet. You never know who's going to be that connection for you. So I have a question relating back to manufacturing. Does he have to have a whole bunch of these made and ready to fly off the shelves the minute people call QVC and want one? Well, the good thing is Kevin did have quite a few units manufactured in advance. So, yes. So when you go on QVC, yes, you have to have product in advance because you have to have it in their warehouse in order for them to ship to the customer. Because this is live on air. It's yeah. live on air. So as customers order the product, it's shipped from QVC's distribution center directly to the customer. So where did he have his made? In China. Okay. His was made in China. He has some molding and things done here uh, in the United States, but it was made in China. And he was very confident that his product was going to sell. So he made a lot of them and he's selling like crazy. And he is on QVC.com right now, even before uh, going on air. And the name of his company is Create a Castle. And that's his website, createacastle.com. So a true entrepreneur. Well, we'll be right back after this message. This evening, we're talking with Lisa Askeles, the inventress. Please feel free to go to my website. It's inventingatoz.com. Email me, info at inventingatoz.com. Coming up next is our executive spotlight, and tonight we have with us Deborah Silver, executive director of the Professional Science Master's Program at Rutgers University. And after that, we'll have pitches by three early stage entrepreneurs. So stay tuned, and if you are just tuning in, go back and listen to Lisa on the podcast. This woman is a treasure trove of information. There's never been a better time to start your own business. The opportunities are infinite and only limited by your imagination and enthusiasm. At Gearheart Law, 
we believe the most successful companies all have one thing in common. They start with a solid foundation first. Gearheart Law has years of experience protecting entrepreneurs' ideas and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at www.gearheartlaw.com. Our professionals will create a custom strategy designed to fit your needs and your budget. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection, licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Visit GearHeartLaw.com. Together, we can change the world. Visit G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W.com. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Now back to Passage to Profit. Once again, Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. It is now time for our executive spotlight, and we are so pleased to have Deborah Silver. Dr. Deborah Silver. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. You're the executive director of a Master's of Science in Business program at Rutgers University. Can you tell us a little bit about the program and what it does? Sure. The degree we offered is called a Master of Business and Science, and the type of academic degree it is is known as a Professional Science Master's. And what it allows students to do is take a Master of Science but add business and professional courses, like regulatory courses and even intellectual property, which... Uh, Yippee! <laughs> uh, <laughs> which Richard was a uh, guest teacher. I was at- very honored to speak <laughs> at the class, and they were fantastic students. It was a fantastic experience, so thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. So the science courses that students take come in what's known as a concentration. The concentrations we offer are things that are really relevant to the industry here in the New York, New Jersey area, such as personal care science, which is chemistry for the cosmetic industry, uh, global food technologies, drug discovery and development, biotechnology. Uh, We have a program in engineering management and, of course, in the computer and information sciences, user experience design, analytics, uh, which is very hot today, and even information technology as well. So what is user experience design? Uh, User experience design is uh, the science of developing websites or even products that mimic the way someone would use it. So it involves technology, it involves sociology, it involves design thinking. So what does someone do with this degree? Uh, Many of our students are working professionals. They're working in the science or engineering industry, and they're looking to get their master's. So this way they can take the science and the business courses together and hopefully uh, get promoted. (laughs) <laughs> Sounds That's good. always a good thing. Well, I told you I was going to tell more this. knowledge and education, of course. <laughs> I was going to tell this story. So our son, who we talk about all the time, got a bachelor's degree in biochemistry and was working at a biotech in Maryland, making not very much money at all. So he went to a graduate program and got a master's degree in bioinformatics and more than doubled his salary. Now, he had he asked for a promotion where he was, and they were like, we'll give you this much. And so he went somewhere else. They're like, oh, we'll give you way more than that. So uh, the master's programs that people go through to enrich themselves and make themselves more attractive really do work, I think. Right. And it's not just promotion. It's also uh, some people who want to switch their careers. And certainly if you're in technology or science today, it's lifelong learning. So you always have to keep your skills up to date. Yeah, and it also, it's a great program. I love the idea because I started as a science guy, and then I became a law and science guy, and now I'm a business law and science guy. And really having all of those different experiences and having training in all of those areas has really helped me move along in my career, and it's kept things fresh and interesting, too. I mean, I like the science piece, but I, after a while, I wanted something more And these kinds of programs, I think, give people a background so that they can move into new roles in organizations or even take on new roles as entrepreneurs and then create even more job satisfaction and become more valuable to their organizations. And we like to emphasize uh, entrepreneurship or even intrapreneurship. Instead of the master's thesis, we have students do a capstone, which is very much like the pitch uh, that's going to go on here. 
Um, and students work in a team. There's the science aspect, the engineering aspect. There's the supply chain aspect that the student has to think about when they're putting together a product. And, of course, the intellectual <laughs> property. Of <aspect>. course, <laughs> the intellectual property. So, But you mentioned intrapreneur, and I think that's interesting because you really started this whole program at Rutgers. And you, you were telling us before that you worked as an intrapreneur. So can you tell us a little about the, how you developed the program? Sure. And it wasn't just me. There are plenty of others who were involved. So uh, before that, I'm a professor in the electrical and computer engineering department, a computer scientist. I uh, was doing that for many, many years. Um, there was uh, um, a movement on campus to think about a new type of master's by um, uh, David Feingold, who was dean of the School of Management and Labor Relations. I uh, nominated myself to be a representative. <laughs> you volunteered. <laughs> Good for well, you were brave. <laughs> Uh, from the engineering school, because I, I thought this was a great idea. I really, uh, really wondered why, uh, you know, I, I didn't think that a traditional master's was talking to the industry professionals in New Jersey. But did you have any business background? Before you started this? I uh, took some courses. <laughs> you know. so, so you talk about it benefiting the businesses. Now, we had spoken before, some businesses will pay for their employees to go through this program, at least partly. Is that correct? Yeah, many companies, especially larger companies, do have a tuition remission benefit that is available to students. That's great. And are many of the programs paid for by the students themselves as well? Yes, yes. So, so there's a, a mix. Great. So they can get this master's while they're working full time. Yes. Uh, and we have a lot of online courses. Uh, we have a lot of executive ed style courses as well. All the courses are given in the evening. I know you lectured in the evening when you came down uh, to Rutgers as well. And I think one of the interesting things uh, that we really did differently with this master's is what I like to say it's a professionally guided science curriculum. So when we looked at the different science professionals working, we're making sure that they're taking the courses that are really relevant to them, like the intellectual property for all the life sciences, the regulatory aspects, uh, supply chain manufacturing, especially around food and cosmetics. I have a question for you. Do you offer internships? We don't offer directly internships. And, and that is, uh, in general, uh, internships, the student gets it and mm -hmm. we, we work with the students, with the internships. But one of the things that we do is we have a program externship. So if, if a student gets an internship at a company, great. And we actually have an executive coach that works with that student while they're in that internship. We have to talk because I love the fact that you brought up personal care and the science behind it. A lot of the people who work for me typically are hands-on. They get to feel the whole body of what manufacturing is all about. So I want to talk with you about that later because I'd love that to sounds. have you know some of your students or all of your students listen to some of the things that we do in our business because we cover the gamut. That would be fantastic. Okay, good. Wow, so, making connections. Connection right here on right. Passes to Profit. You, you can't pass on networking. <laughs> um, it's all about networking. But you brought up uh, the other point of the externships, or, or really what I like to say, call it, is the experiential learning. Mm -hmm. So we do work with a lot of company uh, design problems. They come to campus. Uh, they have a group of students that they work with on a particular problem. So the students get very hands-on experience working on a particular problem. And we do work with startup companies and very large companies as well. And I have to bring up, I learned when teaching the intellectual property course or lecturing at the course, that you actually take your students in the IP course to the patent office. Yes. So they meet examiners and officials from the patent office and they go through a program there for a day. And so that's really an example of the experiential yeah. learning. And I think that's such a great idea, very innovative. Right, in addition to working with companies and, and building up your portfolio, building up whether your technical, analytic portfolio, uh, working on real problems, not just made up problems. So where do you get the ideas for what different types of curriculums to offer, what industry segments to teach to? We do a lot of labor analysis. So we use a, a lot of real-time job analysis using the tools that are out there, like Burning Glass and EMSI. Uh, we also talk to a lot of companies, and our old, we have an industrial advisory board. We pull our alumni and students all the time. Uh, and we talk to professors so we know what research is ongoing, what the next thing is. So it's really a real amalgamation of all of the information sources. And that's exactly why we wanted to have you on this show, because we hear so 
so often, oh, education in this country isn't keeping up with what industry needs. And if you think that, you're wrong because you can go to this program and it's really based on what the job needs are right now, at least in this area and probably in other areas of the country too. Correct. Yeah, so I think it's a great program. You know, when I started working at a company, I read a book about the company, but I wish that I had understood better the whole business of running a company because I was in one little siloed area as a chemist and all I saw was my little piece of it. And I think it's a valuable thing for employees at a company to know kind of the overall picture. Right. One of the things that I know in our leadership and communication class we stress is really the business of your science or the business of your engineering, really trying to understand the entire aspect of it so that you have just a, a more a better perspective and certainly a global perspective. That is so true because when I was a young guy working at a large chemical company, even before I went to law school, there was so much I didn't know. I started out, I had a, a science background, but I didn't know anything about sales or finance or any of these other things. And it just took me to this point in my career now to understand how important all of these things are, how they fit together, and I think your program really can help enlighten somebody earlier in their career, really give them this information, help them be more effective. So I'm so happy that you're doing this. Thank you. And I, and I think it relates to the theme that we were talking about before, really understanding the entire manufacturing process before you just walk into some manufacturer. And I think that is true whether you're an entrepreneur or whether you're working in a company. You really have to understand the landscape that you're dealing with. And when you finish the program, you have a master's degree from Rutgers, which isn't too bad. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, very good. <laughs> Rutgers is a wonderful school, and this is a fantastic program. When I was at the class, I was I met uh, one of the TAs, and she was telling me about how she was just finishing the program. She just got a big promotion at her job, and she thinks that the program, the knowledge that she gained and the drive that she showed to actually finish the degree made a big difference in getting her promotion. And so that's the kind of education that everybody wants, the kind that's going to make a difference in their career. I highly recommend the program for anybody who's looking for new opportunities in their career. One of the other things that we emphasize is really we want the student to be involved in planning their learning journey, whether it's taking particular science courses that are going to be relevant to their industry, and it could be uh, someone who's doing analytics, but they're working in a pharmaceutical company. And if you can take those pharma classes, then please do. We want you to do that. Or whether it's uh, you know someone who's working in a biotech company and needing bioinformatics, they want to be out of more out of the lab and take more of the analytics class. We really encourage that process. We have a lot of the executive coaches as well as our academic advisors working with students on a personal level to make sure that they're taking the courses that are very relevant to what they are doing. That sounds fantastic. And then is there any career counseling for them for after they leave the program? Do those executives participate in that? So we do have uh, quite a few alumni, and they really appreciated our executive coaches and are still using our executive <laughs> coaches uh, to help them. And, and it's not really just career counseling. We really focus on the executive coaching aspect, which is a little different than traditional career counseling. That's really great. You know, you wouldn't expect necessarily a big school like Rutgers to be so personalized and so supportive of the students. It's wonderful that they get this extra little bit. Well, that's that entrepreneurial aspect. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fantastic. So we have to wrap up this segment for now, but thank you so much, Deborah, for coming on the show. How can people find out about the program at Rutgers University? The degree, again, is called a Master of Business and Science, so it's easy to remember, mbs.rutgers.edu. Great. And we'll be right back with more Passage to Profit. Our pitch competition is coming up next. You're listening to WOR 710, the voice of New York. What are entrepreneurs' most valuable assets? Their passion and ideas. We can't protect your passion, but we can protect your ideas. Trust Gearheart Law to protect your ideas with premier patent, trademark, and copyright services. There's never been a better time to start your own business. Contact us at GearheartLaw.com. At Gearheart Law, we have years of experience protecting entrepreneurs' ideas and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at Gearheart Law, www.gearheartlaw.com. Don't let the wrong protection strategy ruin your business. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection and are licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us for 
first. Contact Gearheart Law on the web at G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W dot com. Together, we can change the world. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Passage to Profit continues with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. And now it's time for the pitch portion of the show. But before we start, some vital info. When you're listening to the pitches, please think about which one you like best and go to the Passage to Profit page on the Gearheart Law website. And you need to scroll down to find the poll to vote. And the website is Gearheart Law. G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W. Everybody gets one vote, and the voting is open for one week. Don't forget to like us, too, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And get your friends to vote. And you can remember the name of the show by imagining you're walking down a passage with a huge pot of gold at the end. Passage to profit. And may your passage be short and your profit be huge. Each contestant now gets two minutes to pitch, followed by a discussion with our guests. The overall best vote getter gets a professionally produced video for their pitch, a $500 value. And the winning pitch goes on to our YouTube channel. So let's get started. Our first pitch is by Pat, and I'm going to let him say his own last name. Oh, great. <laughs> I can barely say it myself. It's Guariglia. So All you've right. got two minutes, Pat. All right. Go. My name is Pat. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Roxy. I'm going to start actually with a story about how I came up with the idea. A few years ago, I was having a large party at my new home in New York, and I invited a lot of guests, and I spent almost the entire time at that party serving my own guests, <laughs> making drinks, bringing out food, cleaning up all the stuff that you have to clean up at parties, bringing out the garbage. And at the end of the evening, I said goodbye to everybody, and I was like, man, that, that was not a lot of fun. I actually didn't get to socialize with anyone. And then a couple months later, I did the same thing again. I made the same mistake. I had a large party, was serving all the guests, and did the evening, didn't have any fun. And I started to make jokes with my friends. I said, you know, why isn't there an Uber for parties where I can just get a bartender or a server or somebody that could just come to my house on demand, you know, Uber style kind of app. So I met up with my buddy uh, Dax Boyson and he and I decided that we're going to try to tackle this problem head on. And we decided to create Roxy. So what is Roxy? Roxy is built for hosts. If you want to have an all-inclusive party experience, you go on Roxy to find talent workers like bartenders, servers cocktail waitresses, et cetera, who can come to your private event. Uh, It's an on-demand app that allows you to do that. It also allows you to get food and beverage services. You can invite your guests and so forth right through the app. Our product is an all-in-one service that pretty much eliminates the need to have a caterer or a party planner at your disposal. It also gives private party hosts and their guests an Instagram-like experience where you can post and share pictures uh, to one another in your own private Instagram-like session for your party. Yeah, that's sometimes <laughs> <laughs> necessary if there's an embarrassing picture. Yes, out there. exactly. Uh, so Roxy facilitates the communications and the payments between the host and the workers. It's a multi-sided platform, so that means that the supply side, which is the Roxy Talent, they have to also get on board on Roxy Talent and sign up, and they find the work that way. And host use Roxy to launch their parties and get the help. You got to love somebody who throws so many parties that they need an app like this. So <laughs> we, we, you need to invite us to one of these one of these right. days, okay? And then we'll, we'll, we'll download the app. That's the deal, okay? But other people will see our pictures on Instagram. Oh, no. They better not do anything dumb. <laughs> so is, is the software already done then? Are you up and rocking and rolling now? Or? We sure are. We actually launched just in January. Uh, this year in New York City, and then in March, we launched in L.A. Uh, we did very little marketing and promotion. We only spent about 1000 bucks, and we got about 1,500 users, about 50 parties so far. Average party size is about $360. We actually make money by taking a percentage of the party, so we take about 20% as a service fee. That's great. That's phenomenal success. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, this is very interesting. So you have a website built. Everything is rolling. And how do you find the people to service these parties. We do have a website, but okay. that's just for promotional. It's a it's a mobile app, so we're on iOS, we're on the App Store, and mm-hmm. on Android uh, for both platforms. So to answer your question, how do we find people? That was surprisingly simple. We just kind of rolled the dice and we put an ad in Craigslist to find out what kind of traction we might get. We spent literally five dollars, and within one day, we had a hundred. 150 users sign up. Uh, we were like, okay, that's kind of an odd thing. And of course, we have to vet. There's a vetting process. We do security check on them, a minor security check, and they have to put their profile in there. 
video pictures. They introduce themselves. I put their work history so the customer gets to vet them as well. That's incredible. I think Richard and Elizabeth, you need to sign up for that app for your, your <laughs> for, for, for next year. In, our, in November. Yeah, yeah I think yeah. that's a good idea. 100%. I think it's a great, great concept, great idea. So how long did it take you to build this app? And how many people are involved with your company? It took us a couple of years, actually, to hone the idea. We actually met at the Roxy Hotel, which is directly across the street, which is how we came up with the name Roxy, R-O-X-I. Took no trademark pro- infringement there, There I is hope. no <laughs> trademark. We actually trademarked that name. So we started building it in June of 2018. It took us, we, we did our first beta launch in uh, November of 2018, and we waited a couple months. We iterated on the idea a little bit more, and then we went, all right, let's go and launch it January. Fantastic. Love the idea. I have a question. How do you handle drinking and underage with the bartenders? Oh. That's a wonderful <laughs> question. Uh, so we, from a liability standpoint, we had to think of that as well from you know from an insurance and to protect our company as well. But the way the terms of use and the, the agreements that our customers have to sign, that's actually their responsibility from the host standpoint to make sure that they're not serving or you know, have alcohol for minors, but bartenders, it's also their responsibility as well to ensure that they're not serving minors. So we're actually taking ourselves as much out of that as possible. Of course, there's no ultimate limitation on liability there. So where are you right it. now? Are you just in New York right now? We are in New York and LA primarily. We just did a test launch in Phoenix earlier this month. There's a lot of parties in Phoenix. There are. <laughs> <laughs> I think of that as birthday of, parties. Hey, I was going to say, I, I've been to Phoenix too many times, but maybe maybe there's a market there. I don't know. So is there a pain point that you would like our experts here to address? Something that you want to do that you haven't quite been able to do yet? Like maybe blow this out more, go to another city? I don't want to go to another city yet. I, I think it makes more sense for us to figure out the market traction here to understand the marketing and the promotion engine before we dilute our resources and go to other places. Uber did the same thing when they launched in San Francisco. They didn't try to spread it across the U.S. So the question about pain point, I'm sure I have pain points. I, I'm uncomfortable in this chair right now. So <laughs> I, I don't know. So how Uber-like is the app? I mean, how much notice do you need to give the people who are going to show up to work the party? Is it really instantaneous like Uber or is it more you have to plan ahead of time? <laughs> That's a funny image, actually. It's like you want to have a party in one minute, and you just happen to have a bartender on the street. <laughs> and running down the yeah. street to your apartment, the right? Next door neighbor. <laughs> but there's like three bartenders, and they're all competing for that. <laughs> in, in, in theory, it's instantaneous. Actually, you can have a party, and I think uh, the minimum start time is... 30 minutes, but the likelihood of you getting somebody that's a candidate that you want to have at your event is maybe a little bit lower, but we don't limit that. It's up to the users. And both sides of the equation have to agree to work. So it's not like, you know, I, I want a bartender, I just get a bartender. You actually see the profiles of the bartenders. You get to interact with them and the bartenders or waiters get to interact with the customer as well. And they have to agree. It's a matchmaking, essentially. So what do they wear? So the customer, the host who uses Roxy Mm -hmm. app, can designate the clothing that they want that person to uh, wear when they show up. There are four predetermined wardrobe selections. So it's like the Roxy standard black. There is white shirt, black bottoms. You can even customize the requirement if you want. So like bunny suits? (laughs) (laughs) Why not? (laughs) So I had a question. We have a caterer that was really good that we want to use again this year, but the rest of the people, they were good, but we're not going to look them up to find them again. What if we want just part of it? Would she need to sign up for your app then so we could get her with the other people too? So she would be a food provider or would she be providing the event help? So she would be a food provider. Uh, she could sign up with the app. But good luck getting a caterer yeah. without providing the service at the same time. Caterers are actually using your app for that, to supplement oh. their staffing, because they're often short-staffed. Oh, so they're going to your app to find people to help come serve the food at the party. That's correct. I do think we should use that for our next party, Lisa. Absolutely. Pat, could you just say your name? Because I'm never going to get it right. It's Pat Guariglia. Okay, so anybody who likes to party? Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> now there's an app to help you do that. You are listening to Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart, our special guest, Lisa Askles, our executive spotlight, Deborah Silver. And we will be right back. But if you have missed the program to this point, the podcast will be out tomorrow. And we've had some really good stuff on here that you should go back and listen to. And when you're there listening to the podcast, be sure to check out the Gearhart Law website, www.gearhartlaw.com. You'll see pictures of the team. You'll learn about the patent and intellectual property process. A lot of good stuff there, so make sure you check out our website as well. Hi. 
I'm Lisa Askley, the inventress, founder, CEO, and president of Inventing A to Z. I've been inventing products for over 38 years, hundreds of products later and dozens of patents. I help people develop products and put them on the market from concept to fruition. I bring them to some of the top shopping networks in the world, QVC, HSN, Evine Live, and retail stores. Have you ever said to yourself, someone should invent that thing? Well, I say, why not make it you? If you want to know how to develop a product from concept to fruition the right way, contact me, Lisa Askeles, the inventress. Go to inventingatoz.com, inventingatoz.com. Email me, lisa at inventingatoz.com. Treat yourself to a day chock full of networking, education, music, shopping, and fun. Go to my website, inventingatoz.com. Now back to Passage to Profit. Once again, Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. We're on to the second pitch at Passage to Profit. With us right now is Ben Matthew. Ben, where are you from? From Princeton, New Jersey. All right, Ben. Well, thank you for joining us. You've got two minutes. Go. Hey everyone, my name is Ben Matthew and I'm the founder and CEO of Dovetail. Dovetail is a digital platform that allows organizations like homeless shelters and soup kitchens to broadcast their media item and monetary needs. To give you some background, I do a lot of volunteering and one of the things that I was finding is that a lot of these organizations that run on donations don't necessarily receive the donations that they need when they need them. And this is because their lists online are very stagnant, they're not updated, but then also people tend to stereotype these kind of organizations based on their needs. So for example, if you hear a soup kitchen, you tend to think that they only need food. So when you go to the store to buy something to donate, you really only think of food. When in reality, a lot of these organizations have a lot of different needs. So that's where Dovetail wanted to bridge this disconnect. On the app, these organizations can broadcast their item and monetary needs. So when a user goes on and wants to say, give a, a item need, they can ship the item directly to the organization making the whole donation process as seamless as possible. This year, we introduced a new feature called offline donations. So users can commit to giving uh, items from their households to these organizations, contributing to this whole environment that Dovetail builds. This year, we've been able to process thousands of dollars in donations. So we're really excited about that. And later this year, we're looking to roll out a bunch of new features, one being group donations. So that in the long run, you know, uh, employees of companies can group together to collectively give to an organization. So you know, these companies can have these company-wide donation campaigns to have tremendous impact on their communities. We're also looking to allow people to sign up to volunteer for these organizations, again, to continue to build that community that we want to build. Uh, we also want to become more responsive to spontaneous needs. So, for example, God forbid, a catastrophic event, we can be right there helping the organizations that are helping recover from this, this event. And Lastly, really trying to implement artificial intelligence across the whole platform to really enhance the experience that organizations and users have. In the long run, we want to become a one-stop shop for organizations and users and are really looking forward to growing more. Ben, that is so inspiring. What inspired you to take on this project? I think just, I live an hour from here, so coming to New York City, uh, you know, it's really fun in the city, but you also see the homeless people here and We've traveled a lot and I've seen homeless people and I've just wanted to help. So I've been interested in technology and thought I would bridge those two and uh, try to do the best I can. So, Ben, I want to ask you, how old are you? I'm 17 years old. And you're a rising senior in high school? Yes. How long have you been doing this? With Dovetail, I've been doing this for about two years now. Wow. And I where, am so where, impressed. And where did you get the software? Did you write that yourself or did you have somebody help you with develop that or... Yeah, so um, I wrote a bit and then I started to realize that, again, I'm a high school student, so if I want to get this out fast, I can't <laughs> do it myself. So I recruited some people and I have a development team that's helping me. That's fantastic. And is that through SCAP leaders? Um, so SCAP has definitely helped me grow. The development team itself is not through SCAP. I've found people online for that. I applaud you for what you're doing. You're so young and, Thank and you. just being benevolent and you know philanthropic is awesome. So how do you select the organizations that you give to? There's two ways. One, I just try to contact as many organizations as I can, but also they've reached out to me and saw that we're making an impact and wanted to benefit. Are they 501c3 organizations? Yes. That's wonderful. Hats Thank off to you. you. Congratulations. Amazing. You. Amazing. And how many people have been involved? How many people have donated or given to your organization? To date, we've had hundreds of people donate on the platform. 
uh, totaling about uh, thousands of dollars. So That's- how exactly do the mechanics work? Like, I want to buy the guy on the street in New York a pair of socks. Yeah. So you wouldn't be helping that guy on the street. You'd be helping a homeless organization that can help him. For example, if I were to go onto the app, I would see a list of organizations near me based on my location. And then within an organization like that, they have a list of campaigns. And these campaigns are groups of needs that will all be used for a specific purpose. So for example, a Thanksgiving meal uh, or a winter clothing drive. And then these campaigns have specific needs. So you would donate one of those needs and that would go directly to the organization and then they can help those people on the street. So is there a way for your organization to communicate with donors what items groups are looking for? Yeah, so that's the premise of the app where they understand what people need so that they can post those needs on the app. Once that need is met, it comes off the app so that not everyone is donating the same thing, the pair of socks. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, so... Thousands of socks. (laughs) Um, Each organization posts a need, so for example, socks, but then also the quantity that they're looking for. So say 500 pairs of socks, and if I as a donor go on and donate 10 pairs of socks, the number would now decrease to 490. So how are you marketing the app? How are you getting it known? Uh, I've noticed that a lot of Gen Zers are really passionate about social impact and giving back to the community. So I've been reaching that market through, you know, a variety of social networks, whether it be Instagram, Snapchat, things like that. And really just trying to go on to shows like this and really speak to those who want to have some kind of impact and showing that Dovetail can be that platform to do that on. Although there is only one passage to profit. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I want to point out, too, that Dovetail is D-O-V-T-A-I-L dot org. Yes. If we want to donate, because we're actually doing this, my family and I are doing this for Christmas, we want to go to a soup kitchen and we want to be able to give back. How do we find out in our area a soup kitchen that we can help to provide? If you go on the app itself, uh, we have an iOS and Android app, but if you're on the app, The first thing you see is a list of all the organizations that we work with. So they're going to be listed based on your location. So one that's closest to you would be listed at the top. So that's how you would find an organization to donate to. And how do you compile the lists of these organizations? Do you require some sort of personal contact between you and the organization to get it set up? Can they just sign up online? How does that work? Yeah, so there's a very quick initial onboarding uh, where we work with an organization to make their account. But then from there on, the organization can go on our web app where they upload all of their needs by themselves. It's very easy. Literally, I timed myself. It literally takes 20 seconds. Um, It's very seamless, very easy for these organizations to post these needs. One of the wonderful things about your app is that really there's not a lot of overhead um, and there's not a lot of expense so that people know that if they're giving something to somebody it's actually going to that person and they're getting the full benefit of the donation and there's not a lot of overhead in your organization. You're not really trying to keep a lot of people employed, but Mm -hmm. the people who need the donation are actually getting it. Yeah, we wanted to have monetary and item needs because we know that some people are fine with giving money, but that others want to know that their donation is being used for what they want it to be used for. So that's why we added the items part too. So is there anything that you need help with from our experts here? Just wondering, from your perspective, what have you seen from the younger generation that's really helped them succeed in in entrepreneurship? Because I know sometimes age can be a barrier. So I was just wondering if you had any perspective on that. I think young is a plus. I think the younger you are, the more successful you can be because we're it's it's very impressive that we're seeing yeah. younger people come out. You know, you saw my conference and everything. We love to see younger entrepreneurs. And I think it's um, beneficial for us to hear because we're willing to help. Yeah, I mean, some of the stuff that I face is like people see me walk in the door and they don't really expect that I'm the person behind the computer emailing them. Mm-hmm. So it takes a little bit initial like, you know, pitching, but over time they start to warm up to me. And, and that doesn't out. surprise us at all, Ben. Yeah. You're so articulate and you're so powerful in your knowledge of your product. I, I think just a few minutes with you would impress anybody. Mm-hmm. Thank you. <laughs> and the fact that you built the product as well. And, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Ben Matthew from Dovetail. And how can people reach you again? Yeah, you can uh, go on the website. It's D-O-V-T-A-I-L. Uh, remember, no E because we're cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> dot org. So wonderful to have you. Thanks again for being on the show. 
We'll be right back right after this announcement. There's never been a better time to start your own business. The opportunities are infinite and only limited by your imagination and enthusiasm. At Gearheart Law, we believe the most successful companies all have one thing in common. They start with a solid foundation first. Gearheart Law has years of experience protecting entrepreneurs, ideas, and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at www.gearheartlaw.com. Our professionals will create a custom strategy designed to fit your needs and your budget. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection, licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Visit gearheartlaw.com. Together, we can change the world. Visit G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W. .com. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Now back to Passage to Profit. Once again, Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. Our special guest, Lisa Askeley, our executive spotlight, Deborah Silver. And if you're just tuning in, you have missed some excellent content. So please listen to the podcast. It will be out tomorrow. And we are on to our third pitch now. Micah B. Lewis. I am the CEO and founder of My Bag Check. My Bag Check is an on-demand bag luggage pickup, secure storage, and delivery platform. We monetize the unused trunk space of Uber and Lyft vehicles that are already on the road, which enables our customers to traverse the city hands-free while giving our drivers additional income within their day. The precipice for this idea came about when I was walking through New York City one day after work with my laptop in hand, and a friend called me up and said, hey, let's go grab a drink um, at Union Square. I looked down at my things that I had in my hand, didn't want to carry it anymore, and uh, thought to myself, there should be a better way that I can get this back to my home instead of lugging it around. So as I was walking back to the subway, I thought to myself, I would pay somebody to actually take this back for me. And it's one of those epiphany moments when the clouds open up and you start to see the pearly gates, <laughs> I guess you could say. Um, I saw everyone- I'm glad you saw the pearly gates. I don't know what would happen when my epiphany comes. <laughs> Hopefully I mean, the pearly gates. <laughs> well, it, was, it was actually more like dollar signs is what I saw. Yeah, okay. Um, but everybody else was carrying bags around, things that they really didn't need um, to carry. I looked around and I thought to myself, I, I think- I think I have something here. So that was essentially my, my research. I went home, um, did a little research on Google to see could I build an app, um, found a great piece of software that allowed me to uh, build the app. And then nine months later, I threw it on the Apple iTunes store. And here we are now a year and a half later and um, a lot of happy customers. So uh, that's my bag check. Well, I can see how this could be very dangerous, Micah, because I love to shop. I knew this <laughs> was coming. <laughs> By the way, was I was waiting but for you to go, jump in. If we're going to go out to dinner, it's like, oh, what am I going to do with all this stuff? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. you solved my problem. Exactly. Thank you. So how would I pick this up? Like, I know the guy's going to come and pick it up and stick it in his trunk. So then what happens? Yeah, so actually we, we have a mobile app as well as a web application. So you can find us on the iTunes store as well as the Android store. And it's, it works just like Uber. So wherever you are in the city, even in the five boroughs, Jersey, Hoboken, Newark Airport, you pull out the app. Um, it geolocates you to your location. You put what time you want it to be picked up. You take a picture of your items that are going to be picked up. And then you put in your destination and the time that you want it to be dropped off. And literally, voila, a driver appears out of nowhere, picks up your things for him, secures them with a uniquely numbered zip tie. So you're assured that no one's been in or out of your things and then delivers them back to you at the time and the location of your choosing. That's genius. Yeah. I've got to say, I do not want to carry bags around anywhere. So how much does it cost? Is it based on per hour storage fee or distance? Or how, how do you do the cost calculation on that? It's based upon distance location. So the way it's priced as of now, if it's in the island of Manhattan, we charge $35 up to 24 hours. Um, if it crosses a borough, we charge uh, $80, and if it goes to or from an airport, it is $100, and that's up to 24 hours. And a lot of our customers, what we're seeing, um, our customer base consists of a lot of international travelers. So as you can imagine, coming here, um, New York not being your final destination, say you're going to Chicago, you want to go to Miami as well, too. It can get really costly dragging those bags through the different airports and everything. So we see a lot of our customers here drop off some of their bags here in New York, have us pick them up, store them for them. 
and then they go about their cross-country tour and we deliver them back to them when they come back. Great idea. I Thank do you. a lot of traveling and I have bags everywhere I go and, and usually I'm hitting different parts of one city. So where are they actually storing the bag? I mean, where are they stored? Are they in the car or is there one so, specific location? So I would, I would ask this question of you. Yes. As a traveler, does it matter where your bags are being stored? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not at the bottom of a swimming pool. Well, I mean, it, it, it could matter if you have food items in the bag. Yes. Right? So it's, you don't want it in a hot car. So one of the things we do, um, we don't store food and we don't transport food. So we don't have to worry about like uh, expiring milk in, in the grocery or anything. But to fully answer your question where the bags are stored, for security purposes, we don't disclose our storage locations of it. Honestly, as a traveler, it really doesn't matter, being in part, because the same way when you go to an airport, you don't know how many hands it touches as it's going through the baggage carousel and when you check it in. So, I mean, it really doesn't matter. But I'll make sure if you ever do use the service, I'll let you know where the bags are being stored. I think it's very interesting because for any of us who travel, when you go out of the U.S., especially in Europe, you can always check your bags at train stations and airports so you don't have to be carrying it around, whereas here in the U.S., you can't really do that. So this is a really nice service that picks mm -hmm. that up. Right. And one thing I'll add to that as well, too, there are some companies out there that allow you to just drop your bags off at drop locations, but that still doesn't fully solve the issue. When you think about New York City, you may work in, say, Tribeca, but then you're going to dinner in Midtown. It doesn't make sense to leave your bags here down in Tribeca and have to traverse back down here through traffic or through the subway system and drag those things there. So that's the reason why my bag check is the best option that's out there. It's location independent. So wherever you are, drop your bags there and they'll reappear wherever you need them at at a later time. So are you just in New York right now? As of right now, we're in New York and New Jersey um, and we're doing some testing out in San Francisco as well. What is the vetting process? I mean, people could have very expensive merchandise. We use current Uber and Lyft drivers as of now to actually do our driving. And just from a logical standpoint, they're not going to risk their TLC license for, you know, your dirty laundry that you've trekked around, you know, from airport to airport. So, yeah, we go through, we use their vetting as well, too. And we do personal interviews as well. So I am sorry to say this, but we have to wrap this up. But mybagcheck.com. Yes. Yeah, you'll be hearing from me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we are going to go to another break. We're almost done with the show. But thank you very much. This is Micah B. Lewis. You just heard talking. And you're listening to Passage to Profit with Richard Elizabeth Gearhart on WR710. What are entrepreneurs' most valuable assets? Their passion and ideas. We can't protect your passion, but we can protect your ideas. Trust Gearhart Law to protect your ideas with premier patent, trademark, and copyright services. There's never been a better time to start your own business. Contact us at GearHeartLaw.com. At Gearheart Law, we have years of experience protecting entrepreneurs' ideas and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at Gearheart Law. www.GearHeartLaw.com. Don't let the wrong protection strategy ruin your business. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection and are licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Contact Gearheart Law on the web at G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W.com. Together, we can change the world. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Now more with Richard and Elizabeth. Passage to Profit. People never cease to amaze me. And I say that in a positive way on this show because <laughs> we see such amazing things and talk to such wonderful people. Our guests and pictures are amazing, that's for sure. And remember, everyone, to go to the Passage to Profit page at GearHeartLaw.com, G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W, and vote for your favorite project. So we had Pat with RoxyApp.com. R-O-X-I-A-P-P.com. Then we had Ben Matthew with dovetail.org, D-O-V-T-A-I-L.org. And finally, Micah B. Lewis with mybagcheck.com. Now Google Passage to Profit and make your choice. Remember, you can only vote once and you have until next Sunday at 8 p.m. to vote. 
The best overall vote getter for the show will receive a professionally produced video of their pitch valued at $500. And before we sign off, again, always, thank you, everybody who came. I love talking to all of you every week. It's always great. And I want to say thanks again to our guest, Lisa Ascalese, who brought us over the top in so many ways, and also to Deborah Silver from Rutgers University. Thanks for joining us this evening. Before we go, do you have any final words of wisdom for our audience. I'm so moved, impressed, intrigued. It's like you said, never ceases to amaze me when these young, brilliant minds continuously come up with these incredible solution-oriented products and ideas. And that's what I see here. So I would just say, um, please continue to do what you do and teach us because we're continuously learning. And it's, although some of us are getting older, <laughs> <laughs> we, we still, still want to learn stuff. and we're growing from you guys and, and so, 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 so appreciate it so appreciate everything your great minds and keep on doing what you're doing I, I really uh, enjoyed the start to finish aspect of all of the projects as well the idea the execution and of course the pitch we would like to thank our media maven Kenya Gibson our producer Noah Fleischman Rob Barrett's our engineer and the whole iHeart team Listeners, don't forget to join us next week for another excellent speaker and another round of pitches. And you can start thinking about what your pitch will be. And please don't forget to like us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. This is Richard and Elizabeth Gerhart from Gerhart Law on iHeartRadio with Passage to Profit, WOR 710, the voice of New York. 